Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are off to the races with titration. Titration, titration, titration. That is what we're going to be doing for the next handful of weeks. You're going to be so sick of titrations by the time this round is over. But folks, this is wet laboratory technique, and wet laboratory technique heavily involves titrations. If you go into a job interview and they ask you if you've ever done a titration and you say, uh -uh, then they're going to go, uh -uh, to your job application and they're going to turn it away. You need to understand the basics of a titration. And that's the whole point of this grouping of labs that we are going to give you. And we're going to repeat those titrations again and again and again and again and again because we want you comfortable with them. So in a general chemistry class, especially in chemistry 152, most of the time, they talk about this topic, titration. Okay, so when it concerns titration, there's a few terms that we're going to have to talk about. And titration is a term. So I don't really want to start off this section without really telling you what a titration exactly is. All right, so for instance, here I am working da, 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 in the lab all day long, all right? So what happens is that someone might give me a sample of material to analyze. And they want to know, Tracy, what's in this sample, right? What is in there that I can report to a client? How much is there? Uh, is it too low? Is it too high? And then my question is always going to be, okay, number one, what are we going to be looking for? And then that will lead me into maybe the type of titration that we can use in the experiment. So there's tons of different types of titrations that might be out there. And that's why I have to feel really good about the component that I'm looking for if I just have to kind of make this up on the whim. However, if I'm working for a lab, most of the time there's a method that will be in place that I will simply just pull and I will follow that method. It's as easy as that. So once again, if I can read the back of a cake box, folks, then I should be perfectly okay with a titration method. All right, so titration is the process that we do in a wet laboratory environment. This is wet laboratory technique, folks. That's why we put it in here. So it's a process that allows me to find or determine whatever word you like to use, however fancy you like to sound. It's a process that allows me to find or determine the concentration. Okay, so that's a key word that we're going to have to look at a little bit later. Concentration is typically, it for us and for many labs, given to you with an abbreviation of bracket X. That's what the shortcut for titration is supposed to be. So it allows me to define or determine the concentration of an unknown substance. That's what we do with it. So one of the titrations that you will be doing will be a water hardness titration. So water hardness, we'll talk more about that when that time comes, but we're going to be looking at things like calcium and magnesium. How much calcium, how much magnesium is in the drinking water that I get from the faucet at my house? There is a titration for that. Uh, vinegar, if we want to talk about the food industry, vinegar is a weakened downed acid. So how much vinegar, aka acetic acid, is present in vinegar that I buy from the grocery store? That involves a titration. I could also do a titration with something like aspirin. If I'm making aspirin from scratch in a laboratory and I want to check the quality and the purity of that aspirin, we can use a titration in order to do that. If you're an e-vape person, right, those cartridges are liquids. Those liquids have nicotine. If I wanted to know how much nicotine is in the juice, 
then folks, there's a titration for that. So that's kind of where I want your mind to be at throughout the next handful of weeks. So that is the purpose of a titration. It allows me to target something, and that something I typically want to report a concentration of, meaning how much. How much is there? Does it meet standards? Does it not meet standards? Is there too much? Is there too little? That's the power of a titration, and that's why we use it most of the time. Now, we're going to go back to the very first part of our uh, semester together. And in the very first part of the semester, we talked about this thing called a burette. Now, the burette is going to be brought into the laboratory, and this is what is used in a titration. So we're going to whip out those burettes, just like we did in the very beginning of the semester. You want to make sure that you use the burette and that you read the burette in the proper way. So that's why we went ahead and did that whole training exercise in the beginning of this experiment, folks, because you were going to have to be using a burette many times here at the very end of the semester. So we sandwiched it in with the whole volumetric pipettes and analytical balance training of how to use it the proper way. So I hope that you remember, I hope that you remember how to use the burette the proper way, because if you don't, uh, we need to get the rust off. We need to get you back into the lab and we need to get you to using this thing all over again, making sure you fill it up the right way, making sure there's no air bubbles, making sure that you're reading the meniscus the proper way. All of that is going to come back. So this burette is going to have a liquid on the inside of it. And this liquid is something that we often call our titrant. T-I-T-R-A-N-T, our titrant. So that is the fancy term that we use for the liquid that goes into the burette or the solution that goes into the burette. So what is a titrant? All right, well, a titrant is something that I have either ordered or that I have made. And the reason that I say this is because this has a known concentration. We know how strong that solution is. So that's the number one key component. Whatever goes into my burette, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time is a solution that I know the concentration of. I know the concentration because I've either ordered it, and it comes with a nice little bitty piece of paper that says certificate of analysis, or I've made it. And because I've made it, I now know in the laboratory what concentration it's supposed to be. All right, so that is what we call the titrant. The titrant goes into our burette, and the burette will be used for the titration. Now, down at the bottom of the burette, if you go back and remember your wine titration, folks, that's where we end up seeing this up first, I'm going to have a sample. All right, so my sample is going to sit down here at the bottom of the burette. Uh, the sample can also have some added solvent to it. Uh, don't be alarmed because the solvent does not have an effect on the amount of sample that's present. Now, when I say that, what I basically mean is that if you go back and remember the wine titration that you did, you pipetted a certain amount into the flask. Well, it didn't go anywhere, did it? It stayed in the flask. But we allowed you to add water to that sample. Okay, well, you did dilute it. You diluted the sample, but... 5 milliliters or 10 milliliters, whatever you decided to use at that point, it was still 5 milliliters of sample that's still in there. It's still 10 milliliters of sample that's in there. You did not spill any of it. It's still in the flask. The solvent typically just dilutes it down, and in particularly, it's for the color change. We want to make sure that we have enough liquid or volume in there to see a really good color change throughout the titration. Well, at that point, we only called this sample, sample. That's all that we did. But there is a term that comes along with sample, and this is called the titrand, 
T I T R A N D. Oh gosh, right? Titrant and Titrand. Okay, those are always confusing to people. I know. I get it, folks. I was there at one point too. So that is why we don't really use the word titrand very often in a laboratory because these two do get confused quite a bit. So because of that, I'm giving you the definition and I'm giving you what that word represents, but we typically just call it sample. You put your sample under the burette. That sample is going to get titrated. It's going to get titrated with the titrant and this process is called a titration. All right, so that's kind of some term or some terminology that we need to know a little bit before going further into this process. Now, the most common is going to be an acid and a base titration. This is the most common titration that it seems that's out there. It's the most common that's presented in academia. It's the most common for the basic wet laboratory processes, the traditional acid-base titration. But folks, there's tons of different ones, and that's the purpose of this grouping. We're going to get you to do titration after titration after titration because we want you to understand that it's more than just an acid and a base sometimes. Okay, but this is where we're going to start out. It's one of the most common, it's one of the most basic types of titrations that are out there. So it gives us a good starting point, but there is more to the world of titration than just acid base. All right. Uh, the other thing that we also need to talk about is this term called indicator. Uh, you actually used an indicator in the wine titration that you did. And the indicator is just uh, some type of chemical or solution or reagent that changes color, right? And it changes color based most of the time on the pH of the solution. And now we know what pH is supposed to be, right? pH, typically the scale of 1 to 14, acids and bases, which means that indicators typically are a color up to a certain pH value. And then after we go over that pH value, that indicator changes color. And that is a very good sign for me in a titration to stop. So out of the indicator family, folks, there's probably a hundred or more of these indicators that we can choose from based on the type of titration that we do. So phenophthalene is going to be the most common and it seems like phenophthalene will be the only indicator out there because that's the only one that we get you to use over and over and over again but that's a lie indicators there's tons of choices they're used in different types of titrations depending on the samples that i'm given to a laboratory or from a laboratory all right so indicators Tons of different choices, and we actually have an indicator chart in the laboratory, at least at one point we did, All right? Now, the indicator is going to give me a pH color change. That's great and all, because that will allow me to visually see it, all right? And that's good. I want my eyeballs to see the color change. However, we want to pick an indicator that is going to change around something that we call the equivalence point. So the equivalence point is an area where things are equivalent, right? Okay, equality for all. Okay, so equivalence point basically means it's the concentration of the acid and the concentration of the base, and that is where they are equal. That's called the equivalence point. The equivalence point is typically abbreviated because, again, we're quite lazy, and we like to abbreviate it with EP. So whenever we talk about EPs, we're talking about not EP go home, we're talking about EP for equivalence point. All right, so equivalence point changes differently depending on what I'm titrating. I need something that will pick out the equivalence point, which is an indicator, and that's why we have tons of them. That indicator will change color based on pH values, 1 to 14. 
all of that is determinant on the type of sample or tie trend that I have in the titration. And that sample will be titrated against a titrant, which is the liquid of known solution that I have. All right, folks. So there's your terminology lesson. Big words. I know big words, but we got to get used to them because we are going to be dabbling in the world of titration for quite some time. All right, so here's a quick schematic of a titration setup. So I see the Erlenmeyer flask down at the bottom. That Erlenmeyer flask has a solution. Typically, that solution does have a known volume. And the reason is because I put it there, okay? I pipetted it into that flask. So I know how much is there, at least. I just don't know the concentration of it. So the burette is up here at the top. The titrant is in that burette. I open the stopcock up and drip, 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 drip down into the sample it goes. And that titrant is a known concentration and it's also a known volume. It's a known volume because when this color change happens, I stop the burette and I read the volume that comes from it. A couple of other terms that we also want to throw out maybe here in the very beginning is this concept of what we call a strong and a weak. And I might have mentioned this in the pH lecture, but I'm going to mention it again because repetition is your friend. So strong acids basically spit pew, 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 all of the proton off of the molecule. So this is our big spenders right here, strong acids. They will spit proton every single time off of their molecules. They do not want the proton. They're going to live life to the fullest and they're going to go broke in the very first day. Weak acids, however, again, have that savings account. They don't want to pew, 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 off the protons of the molecule. They're going to keep some of them behind and that's very important. So strong acids, sometimes strong acids give off all the protons. Weak acids, well, they give off proton, but not all at one time. They have a savings account and they will spend as needed. Strong bases and weak bases are very similar. However, we can talk about bases in terms of hydroxide content or we can talk about bases in terms of proton acceptor. Remember, I told you there were tons of different definitions of acid and base that were out there, and we just picked one set, and we said these are the ones that we're going to use. As far as the titration goes, we often have this thing called a titration curve. All right, so let me show you what a titration curve is. Uh, we're going to use a little bit of common sense, and we're going to think about this as we begin to draw it. So a titration curve. All titrations will have a curve that's associated with them. It might not look exactly like this, but if we had to plot the data and make some type of graph, they all would take a similar characteristic shape. All right, and we're going to start talking about, okay, well, here's my flask, and let's say that that flask has an acid on the inside of it. And I'll put a pH probe down in there. What pH is am I going to have? What pH is it going to be? Is it going to be lower than 7 or higher than 7? Well, I hope that you told me lower than 7 because it's an acid, folks. There's an acid there. The pH is going to report there's an acid there. So on a titration curve, what we do is we typically plot the pH value on the y-axis, up and down. This is our pH value that goes here. Well, I'm just going to kind of kick it here in the middle at 7. Anything below 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, so there's my pH value scale. Well, in the beginning of a titration, if I have a pH probe that's inside of that flask, folks, it's probably going to give me an acid value. So I'm probably looking at the beginning of the titration, which is my 0 0.00 right here. At this point in the beginning, I probably will have a pH that's going to be acidic. So somewhere in here 
is where maybe I'm looking at. Now that will change depending on how strong or how weak my acid is. That starting point could change on me a little bit and that's okay. No one said that it couldn't. It might be a little bit higher sometimes. It might be a little bit lower. So we just have to be comfortable with that idea. Okay, well, the purpose of a titration is to drip, 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 drip down into that flask. Well, if I have an acid down here, folks, that would be kind of silly if I had an acid up here in the burette, right? I can't really react an acid with an acid. It's going to take both. It will take an acid and a base. So the base is probably what's in my burette up at the top. So that base is going to drip, 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 drip down into the flask. The base will react with the acid. Well, here's what goes on. As I add the base into the acid, pew, 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 that's what goes on. So I have these little acid molecules that are floating around. These little acid molecules are happy and, you know, there's not a worry in the world. Yay, wee! I mean, that's what they're doing and the flasks are swimming around. A nice summer day with no skull. Well, as I add the base, I'm adding the parents into that flask. And as the base goes in, the base is going to look at these little kids and go, uh-uh, you're coming home. Pew! Off it goes. They get killed out. Maybe that's not a very good analogy for parents and kids, but that's basically what goes on. We neutralize them. So there's a lot of acid in that flask, and we're adding drops of base. So over time, what do you think is going to happen? I'm adding base little bit by little bit. I'm neutralizing the acid that is in that flask. So over time, as I add a certain number of milliliters or volume of titrant to that sample flask, my pH is going to start to slowly go up and up and up and up, right? I'm just going to start to see an increase in the pH value. And that's because there's less and less acid that's involved. There's less acid that's present. It's getting neutralized by the addition of the base that I'm giving it. So base goes in, huh, you're coming home with me. And then it grabs the kids and it takes them away. And there's less and less kids in the pool as the time goes on. Well, sooner or later, a parent's going to come in and it will grab the very last kid out of the pool. That's the last little acid molecule. Poor things. And now there's no more kids in the pool anymore. There's no more acid in my flask. Okay, well, I keep shoving parents into the pool. And the next parent comes in and says, wait a minute, I'm supposed to walk away with a kid. And I don't see a kid for me to walk away with. And at that point, we have extra base. When the extra drop of base happens, folks, what do you think is going to happen to my pH? That extra drop of base is going to skyrocket my pH straight up. And that's because there's no more acid anymore. My base now has entered into that sample flask. I now have more base than acid. And because I have more base than acid, then I am on the basic side of the pH. Now, if I keep adding base to it, I will keep getting an increase of pH up until where my solution is supposed to be. So what happens is that on a titration curve, I typically see this gradual increase that happens in the beginning. And I see this gradual increase that happens here at the very end. That is why they have slight curvatures that are associated with them. But in the middle here, when it skyrocketed, that is an important point in the titration curve. Because folks, right here in this inflection point area, 
okay? That's where this graph begins to change direction. In this area, halfway, at the halfway mark is what we call the equivalence point. That is the area where the concentration of the base equals the concentration of the acid. And with a strong acid and base, this is going to happen at pH of around 7. Not all titrations will happen there. It really depends on what I use. Do I have strong acids, weak acids, strong bases, weak bases? All of that plays a role in the shape of the titration curve. But we're starting off easy. We're starting off simple. And this is the type of titration that we're going to be looking at. So there is the shape of a titration curve. And it has this S shape that's associated with these. All right. So here's maybe a better drawing of what we just did. Uh, this is sodium hydroxide in the burette, which is a base. And then here's hydrochloric acid that sits down below. That's an acid. Both of these are very strong. So in the beginning, I have a pH of around 2-ish. And as I add sodium hydroxide, little bit by little bit, drop by drop, I'm slowly killing out the acid, little molecules at a time. And then it's going to get to a certain point. And on this graph, it looks like 50 milliliters have been added. So at 50 milliliters, whoosh, there goes the S shape of the titration curve. So it skyrockets at this point. And when it skyrockets, that is the area where my equivalence point is going to be. Halfway there, I come over and I see a pH of around a 7. Well, after the equivalence point, I now have nothing but extra base. And now we're on the pH side of the house that is basic. Here's my pHs of 10s, 11s, and 12s. So folks, there is your typical titration curve. And in this example, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Well, here's another one just to give you an example. This other one, sodium hydroxide, still in the burette. But down below is something that we call acetic acid. So acetic acid is not hydrochloric. It's different. But look at the shape. You still see an S curve. You still see that s shape that happens on the graph so the differences uh, first the ph starts a little bit higher because this is a weak acid not a strong one so the ph is a little bit higher but as i add base drip 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 i get an increase in the ph up to a certain point at 50 milliliters it just so happens to take off again like a rocket ship and there's my equivalence point and my equivalence point this time is going to be a little higher than 7. Okay, well, that's normal. But we still see the basics that are present. And that's what this is all about. Now, with this very first titration, we are going to go through a process called standardization. Standardization is a very important process whenever I make a base to titrate with. You know, we do not like to order things, folks. Uh, you know, we pay for water to be shipped when we do that, and we hate that. So in a laboratory, we like to make our solutions from scratch, and we can do that without a problem. Uh, the problem here, though, is that we do not get exact amounts that I should be weighing out. You know, there's no way, unless I stay over there for hours, to try to get like 25.00000 grams. I'm just not going to be able to do it. So instead of wasting my time and instead of, you know, taking up everyone else's time to try to make this solution, we just get something that's really close. Okay, that's the key word here, close. If I get close to the amount that I'm supposed to weigh out, then it's okay. So I'll use that mass and I'll transfer that into a flask and I'm going to lose some when I transfer. And then I add water or solvent. I'll make the solution with it. And then all of a sudden, maybe I have made 
my sodium hydroxide that needs to go into that burette. The problem here, though, is that if you do make it, what is the exact concentration? Well, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Okay, well, I have a recipe. And that recipe will tell me, weigh out 10 grams of NaOH. Okay, well, I go to the balance and I don't weigh out 10 grams. What if I did a 9.9643 grams instead? I'm not going to have the concentration that they told me to make in the recipe. Mine's going to be a little bit weaker because I've used less. Well, there's no way I'm going to stay over there and try to get 10 grams perfectly. That's silly. Even when I did get 10 grams perfectly, there's going to be a transfer step that's going to be involved most of the time. I'm going to lose some of the transfer step. So just because I read a recipe and I tried to get the exact amount that I need, I didn't get the exact amount that I need. So this concentration that's stated in the procedure is not going to be the concentration that I have actually made because I didn't actually weigh out 10 grams. I weighed out something a little bit less. So there is a process that I have to go through for my mistake. And that process is called standardization. It allows me to get the exact concentration of the sodium hydroxide that I have made in the laboratory. But it doesn't have to be just sodium hydroxide, folks. It's the concentration of any solution that I have made. And there's different standardization procedures based on what I'm trying to standardize. Hopefully that makes sense. So for instance, if I should be putting silver nitrate in the burette, I could make silver nitrate, but I would have to standardize silver nitrate because I made it. I need to know the exact concentration that I've made. That goes for anything that goes into the burette. Anything that goes into that burette, you have to know the exact concentration of. Okay, the option here is to go through an order. Order the exact concentration that you need. But when you do that, folks, you're going to be paying for shipping. And when you pay for shipping, it's mainly going to be water. And this cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching runs into a lot of money for a laboratory. That's silly. We're trained to work in a laboratory for this reason. That is why we're hired. So we can do things like this and not waste money for the company. So in this lab experiment, we are going to be standardizing sodium hydroxide. We're going to be making sodium hydroxide, and then we're going to standardize that sodium hydroxide. So this is how we do it. We're going to take a burette, and we're going to fill this burette full of the NaOH that I have made or that you have made. Down at the bottom, we're going to have a sample. And we're going to have to standardize the NaOH that's in my burette up here at the top. Well, if this is a base, I hope that you're going to tell me this flask needs an acid. It does. Ding, ding. Correct. Good for you. Well, I need some type of acid. The problem here, though, is that I need to be really careful with the acid that I pick. Uh, we typically do not like liquids or solutions of acids. Their concentrations can be a little weird. Their concentrations can change. Even the sodium hydroxide that I make today will change next week. It will change slightly. So very often we have to standardize uh, typically the day that we use it, and it will only be good for probably that day or the next day. And then we like to standardize again because they do constantly fluctuate on us. So when I talk about acid with this standardization technique, there is a better acid that's out there with a known concentration. The other thing is that these liquids and solids, when acids are concerned, folks, they have a label on them, and that label is a percentage or a concentration, and this will vary. It, they will give it to me in a window, and that's not good enough, right? So for instance, 
hydrochloric acid. Okay, I order hydrochloric acid on the label. If I look at hydrochloric acid, it might say like concentration is 35 to 38 percent. Okay, that does me no good. 35 to 38 uh, percent? Look at that wiggle room that's in there. How do I even know what that acid is supposed to be? That is not going to be good for standardization. So I have to choose something that's not going to fluctuate like that. I have to choose something that's not going to change. I have to choose something that I know how much is in there because I did it. And the acid that we like to use for the NaOH standardization is something called KHP. This is an acid but folks, it is a solid. So I can weigh this out on a balance. And because I've weighed it out on the balance, I know how much is in that flask. And at that point, all is good because I am not relying on a wishy-washy solution with a wide window range of concentration to standardize my component with. So the whole concept again, I've made the NaOH. I don't really know exact concentration of the NaOH. And by standardization, I will get that exact concentration that I've made. So KHP, this is what it looks like. You do not have to memorize this structure. But KHP stands for potassium hydrogen phthalate. Okay, so potassium, there it is, right there. Hydrogen, oh, look, right there. Phthalate, well, it's probably the rest of the molecule. Well, wait a minute, you said that this is an acid. I don't really see a hydrogen. Oh, well, yeah, I do, right? There's a hydrogen there. There's a hydrogen that can be spit off by the KHP. That hydrogen I've already circled. It's stated right there beside of that oxygen. Potassium, it's even involved in the name. Hydrogen phthalate. So by definition, this is an acid. This acid can donate a proton. That proton is going to come from the hydrogen that I've circled on the structure. The potassium has nothing to do with it, right? So this acid will react with the base. All right, and this is how this happens. I'm going to take NaOH and I'm going to react it with KHP. Something's going to happen here, folks. A reaction's going to happen. Two couples go into a bar. They see each other's partners and they get frisky. They leave the bar with different partners than what they came in with. They couple swapped. They swingers. So instead of the Na and the OH leaving, what we will have is the Na and the K and the P that leaves together. And this hydrogen will leave because that's the definition of an acid. It spits the hydrogen off. And that hydrogen will go and hook up with the OH piece. And this HOH is water, H2O. It's the same thing. It's just written a different way. And this is pretty important. And the reason that I say that this is important is because this is going to play a very strong part in the math that is coming around with the standardization. What I've just written, NaOH, KHP, gives you the Na and the Kp part and then the H2O part. This relationship is one couple and one couple. So for every one NaOH that comes in, one KHP reacts with it. That's how I want you to interpret that. So one molecule of NaOH will react with one molecule of KHP. Well, if I don't want to talk about molecules, they're really tiny. Molecules are really tiny things. 
then I could also talk about this term called mole. One mole of NaOH is equal to one mole of KHP. Hmm. Well, what's a mole? It's not the little critter that goes under the ground. A mole is just a term that we use for an amount. In other words, if I say the word dozen, what do you think of? Twelve. If I say the word pair, what do you think of? Two. If I say the word mole, what you need to think of is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Because that means there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in reference of NaOH and KHP because these are molecules, not atoms from the chart. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of NaOH. Now we're talking like big talk. Tons, tons. Let's look at this number. Six, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. That's how many molecules we are talking about when we describe Avogadro's number. That is what this term is. Avogadro's number. I had a chemistry instructor and he swore up and down it was called Avocado's number. It's not Avocado's number, it's Avogadro's number. It was a language thing. Avogadro came out just like avocado, so he would always say Avocado's number in lecture. It's not Avocado's. And you wonder why I turn out the way that I have. Okay, so one mole of NaOH is exactly going to react or be equal to one mole of KHP. And when we talk about mole, this is the number that we're talking about. That many molecules swimming around in your flask. And there's tons more, by the way. There could be tons more that's there. All right, well, this is also going to lead me into concentration. Right? I mean, the whole purpose of this is to find concentration of things. The concentration that we want you to focus on first is something called molarity. And molarity is going to be capitalized with an M. That is our abbreviation for molarity. M-O-L-A-R-I-T-Y. Molarity. In order to calculate molarity for a concentration, what we do is we take the number of moles that we have from up here... And we know that because we know the amounts, and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. And then we'll divide by the liter. Molarity is always in terms of liter, never milliliter. Very often in a laboratory, we're using milliliters of stuff. So we have to remember to convert this number over when we use this particular type of equation. So molarity is going to be the concentration that we're going to report Molarity is concentration, so the higher the number, the higher the molarity, the higher the concentration. Lower the concentration, lower M value. So we're going to report molarity as an answer for the concentration. Molarity can only be calculated by taking moles of my substance divided by liter. Now, this is only one way to express concentration, folks. We have tons of others. We have things called normality. We have parts per million, parts per billion. We have weight percent. We have volume percent. We have tons of other ways to calculate concentration. Molarity is not the only one. And quite honestly with you, molarity is not the common one even though general chemistry might tell you otherwise. It's just the one that they focus on the most. 
So the key here is that I can calculate molarity if I know volumes of things. And I know volumes of things because I'm putting it into the titration. But the key is this mole. How do I get this mole term? Okay, well, this is what you need to do. In order to calculate moles of anything, you are going to take the mass of whatever it is, whatever you used, and you're going to divide that by that molecule's molecular weight. Molecular weights can be calculated by you. That's a different day on a different story. Molecular weights can be provided to you in the lab directions. Molecular weights can also easily be found using something like Wikipedia to save you some trouble. Molecular weights can also be found on the bottles of the reagents that you use. So, for instance, in this lab experiment, I'm going to start with KHP. So, KHP is a solid, and KHP is going to be measured out on the balance. And let's say that I have a mass of 0 0.4000 grams of KHP. I just made that up. Okay, so if I wanted to calculate the moles of KHP, remember that name just means a unit, that unit means an amount. If I wanted the amount of KHP, so that way all of these things can talk to each other. Moles is the common language that everybody understands. We need to get everything into mole. I will take, based on the directions up above, my 0.4 grams of KHP, and I divide that by the formula weight of KHP. Okay, well, how do I find formula weight of KHP? So here's the Wikipedia page for KHP. I just typed in KHP and hit Wikipedia. This is what shows up, and to save you a little bit of work for now, if you just scroll down to the bottom and you look over here to the left-hand side, you'll see some data of KHP, and then you'll see molecular mass that's right here. So molecular mass is 204.22. All right, so that means in this equation, I would divide this by 204.22 grams per mole. All right, that's how I calculate moles of the material that I'm using. Okay, so what this means is that in the flask, I have a certain amount of moles of KHP that's present. Up above, I'm going to drip, 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 drip my NaOH into that flask. So if I know how much KHP there's in the flask and my NaOH is in the burette up here and I slowly add drip, drip, drip until I get a color change where my indicator is going to be and that tells me where to stop the titration, at that point is where the concentration of NaOH equals the concentration of KHP, my moles, my moles of NaOH equals the moles of K KHP. Well, if I know how much I started with, then that is the volume that I have of sodium hydroxide. So for instance, in this titration, if I have, let's say 0 0.5 moles of KHP, that's wrong, but I just made it up. Then when my color change happens, that will be the point of which I would have 0.5 moles of NaOH. And if I know the volume that it took from the burette, look at what I have. I have moles of NaOH, and I have liter of NaOH from the titration, and I can use those two numbers and calculate molarity. So before I go any further with the calculations of this lab, let's just take a look at the lab and we'll work from there. So this is the standardization of sodium hydroxide. Uh, what you're seeing on the screen is the color change that will happen. So in acidic conditions, KHP will be a clear 
colorless solution, folks. Clear and colorless mean something different. Clear means you can see through it, and colorless means, of course, there's no color associated with it. So, so in the beginning, in the acid, your KHP flask that sits down below, when you add your, your uh, phenophthalene indicator, it will not have a color at all. Over time, as you get closer and closer to the point where your base is equivalent to the acid, you will start to see a very faint pink color that will form. Do not go to the fuchsia that you see over here on the right hand side. If you go to the fuchsia, we call that over titrating. Over titrating means you've added too much liquid from your burette, which also means that you're gonna report a inaccurate concentration readout for your sodium hydroxide. So baby pink is what we're after, not fuchsia pink. All right, so there's the reaction that's happening uh, within the lab experiment. Uh, the directions are gonna start on the third or fourth page. You're going to set up a burette with a burette uh, clamp and a ring stand, just like you did before in the beginning of the semester. It says, using a balance, measure out 0.3 grams of potassium hydrogen phthalate and record the exact weight in your sheet. Please record the exact weight. There should be a fourth decimal place there because our balances do four decimal places. So make sure that you record your masses to four decimal places in your data sheet. Uh, and then it says add the KHP to the flask, add enough water, uh, at least 50 milliliters or under. Uh, just make sure that it's fully dissolved before you go further. Uh, if you use a magnetic stir, that's great. Place it on the stir beneath the burette, add your magnet, turn the stir on so that way it will constantly mix these solutions for you throughout the titration process. You'll have a much better number if that goes on. Number four, you'll add the indicator, phenophthalene. Uh, phenophthalene, P-H-T-H, is typically how we abbreviate that in the lab. So when you see the bottle of P-H-T-H, that is phenolphthalene uh, that we are using as the indicator. Two to three drops is really all that you need there. Then it says using the burette, fill it for your sodium hydroxide solution, and then you're going to titrate until those solutions turn pink. Uh, you're going to do this four times. So the data sheet here mass of the KHP. All right, so let's say 0 0.4000 grams. Let's just say that's what I got from the first trial. Next, the initial volume of sodium hydroxide on the burette. Most of you are going to fill this up to the zero mark, and that's where you'll start. So zero will be there. The final volume is where the solution turned pink. So let's say that this was 22.1 milliliters. I don't know. Again, I just made that up. Volume of the NaOH used, well, that's 22 minus or 0.1 minus zero. So we've used a total of 22.1 mils. In your trial two, you can pick up from there. You don't have to refill it back to zero. Some people like to do that, though, but some people do not. Uh, so that's really up to you. Uh, for me, I do not fill it back up to zero if I know that the titrant amount in the next trial will be okay. Meaning if this took 30 mils, that means my trial two will probably take another 30 mils, but my burette is only 50 mils, folks. So I will not make it to the end point without refilling that burette up to the top. So I normally do not do it, but some people in the very beginning, they do refill it to zero every single time. And then it says calculate the concentration. All right, so to calculate the concentration, we give you the equation down here at the bottom. Molarity equals, so grams of KHP times 1,000 divided by 204.22 times the milliliters of NaOH. This is a one-shot kills all kind of method. You just plug your numbers in where you need to find them, and then that will pop you out a concentration for an answer. However, if we were doing this for real without that shortcut, uh, what we would have to do, we'll walk through the math one more time. I'll take the mass of KHP divided by the 204 point blah, 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 whatever it was, the formula weight, in order to get moles of KHP. Well, that number is also equal 
to the moles of NaOH. We already said it was a one-to-one -one relationship. I have that one. I know how many moles of NaOH that it took to kill that out. Once I have moles of NaOH, I'm then going to divide that by the liter of NaOH that it took from the burette. The key here, though, is that your burette holds milliliters. So you need to convert that to liter. So you'll take your milliliters, let's say it was 10 mils, to convert that to a liter, milli is a thousand, so you'll divide by a thousand. So that is the number that will go in for L. And then this will give you the molarity of that solution. So they want you to do this four times. And after that fourth time, folks, they want you to do a quick average. Now, in addition to that, we are also going to want you to come in and use our titrando at the very end. So after you do your hand titrations, we want you to get used to the concept that there is a piece of equipment that can titrate automatically for you. And we want you exposed to this technology. We want you to be comfortable using this technology. And throughout these next few titration experiments, we're going to get you on this almost every single time. So what will happen is that for this part of the lab experiment, you will take your KHP sample. This will be like number five. After you do four of them by hand, you'll take a fifth one. And then you'll take it over to our titrando into another room and you will titrate that KHP sample using the automatic titrator. So I'm not going to go into the details with this right now. Uh, we will do that one-on-one -on -one with you as you venture over and begin to use this for the very first time. Uh, a couple of things I do want you to kind of pick out though. Number one, the Titrando does use a pH meter or a pH probe in order to do its job. So there's a pH probe that you're going to see goes into your solution. Uh, this tubing here that you're seeing to the right hand side that ventures off into the beaker, this is the burette tip. So that is what's going to deliver your titrant. Uh, here in the center of the instrument, this is going to be your burette. So this is what will hold the titrant. And then the bottle here in the back that will be where your titrant will go. So this will be loaded up. It will be ready to go. The only thing that you have to do is come over and put your sample on there, mix with a little bit of water, put the probe down on the inside of it, and we will show you how to operate the software. And this instrument will titrate for you automatically and provide you a concentration for the NaOH. Now keep in mind, the NaOH that will be back here in the instrument will be different than yours. We have made this ourselves. We have put this solution into the back end of it. So this will not match your NaOH. So you need to kind of keep this separate. This is just getting you familiar with the instrument. That's all that we're doing here. Do not take the fifth one and average it with the other four because that is not the same solution. You cannot average different solutions together. So you take your four that you did by hand, provide an average. And then this fifth one is a different NaOH that you did not make. We made it. So you cannot include that in the average in your lab experiment. All right. So after that, a couple of questions at the end, folks, and that's all that there is to the standardization lab. A very quick lab. I know here we are in an hour, an hour of pre-lab video. I know they just seem like they get longer and longer. But the key here is that be careful, take your time, go slow, because you will overshoot the titration. And if your four trials do not work out, and if we're not very happy with the precision of the four trials, then folks will make you go back and do it again. So make sure that you uh, feel really comfortable with the process and the technique. Make sure that you give us good data. And if so, we'll check you out and you go home. Uh, so the fifth sample uh, that's not included in this table that you're seeing right there, but it will be in your version of the lab write-up. Uh, that fifth sample will be done using automated instrumentation 
for the titration. So good luck. We'll see you in there. Again, this is all about making sodium hydroxide, not really knowing the exact concentration because you made it, and standardization is going to allow you to report the true concentration of what you should have made in the lab.